Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at geologic time. So in this video we're going to be focused on some of the milestones that uh, life achieved during the early, middle and later portions of geologic earth history. And this is going to correspond to sections 9.11 and 9.12 of your textbook. So when we look at life from the Precambrian, we can see that on the whole, it's actually relatively simple. For most of the Precambrian, life was single-celled organisms. So we're looking at organisms like bacteria and algae. And these organisms would have produced their food either through photosynthesis or through fermentation. And these would have been the methods through which they would have produced energy. Of course, uh, the animals that photosynthesize would have been very, very important because what they will have been doing is they will have been stripping carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they will have been replacing it with oxygen as a byproduct. And so as the photosynthesizing organisms like algae became more and more populous in the oceans, it meant that more and more carbon dioxide was being scrubbed from the atmosphere and it was being replaced by oxygen. So slowly as we progress throughout the Precambrian, we see see a steady increase in the amount of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. So as I said, most of the life that we see in the Precambrian is single-celled, and we don't really start seeing complex multicellular life until right towards the end of the Precambrian. Now, in terms of indications of earlier life in the Precambrian, we have stromatolites. So stromatolites are essentially produced by colonies of photosynthesizing algae. And a stromatolite itself consists of layer after layer after layer of sediment, one on top of another. So each one of these layers of sediment essentially represents one layer of algae. And so the algae would form a layer, it would happily photosynthesize away, but eventually that layer of algae would get covered in sediment. So that layer gets buried in a layer of sediment, and then a new layer of algae forms over the top. Then that gets buried in sediment, then a new layer of algae. And so you can see over time what happens is you have layer after layer of algae forming, and each time these layers of algae get covered by sediment and essentially a new layer of algae develops on the top. And so what we end up with is we end up forming these in three dimensions, these mound-like structures, which consist of very, lots and lots of very fine layers, one on top of another. Now, in terms of Precambrian life, as I said, it stays relatively simple throughout most of the Precambrian, but right at the end of the Precambrian, we see life becoming a lot more complex. And we see this sudden uh, increase in the complexity of life uh, due to the formation of a group of animals which are referred to as the Iacarian fauna. Now, they were a very, very widespread group of animals. We have fossils uh, of the Idiocarian fauna occurring from areas like Australia and Poland and Russia and Canada. And so that shows us that these animals were actually quite widespread and therefore probably quite successful. Now, they didn't have shells and they didn't have skeletons. They were, on the whole, soft-bodied organisms. There were some of them that seemed to have had the first indicators of having some kind of exoskeleton, some kind of shell, but on the whole, we believe the vast majority of them did not have any kind of shell or skeleton. Now, as we transition into the Cambrian, or into the Paleozoic, shall I say, we have the Cambrian explosion. And so the Cambrian explosion is uh, seen in the rock record as a sudden appearance of a large number of organisms that have shells. And a couple of examples are provided here, so that's organisms like trilobites and brachiopods. Now, these groups of organisms are probably related to the Idiocarian fauna. So some of those uh, members of the Idiocarian fauna that were starting to show the early stages of shells probably continued to evolve and eventually evolution led to the formation of more robust solid shells which were made of uh, in some cases pure calcium carbonate and in other cases like the brachiopods it's a mixture of other materials such as calcium phosphate and organic proteins which actually make up the shell. So you can see anyway, there's a quite a distinct difference. All of a sudden, as we move into the Cambrian, we see lots and lots of organisms with shells. 
And the presence of shells means that these organisms can begin to become much larger. Because once you have a structure around which or onto which you can begin to attach muscles, those muscles can naturally begin to become a lot larger because they're attached to a rigid frame. And so what we see as we progress into the Cambrian is we see life becoming more complex and we see life becoming much bigger. So obviously the question becomes is, well, why do we see this sudden explosion in life as we head into the Cambrian? Well, there's a few possible reasons and they probably all work together. So in the late Precambrian, global conditions on the whole would have been relatively cold. So we know that in the late Precambrian, there were several very large glacial events, and this would have caused global seawater temperatures to be on the whole lower than now. And of course, we know that generally life doesn't like cold conditions. On the whole, life likes warmer conditions. So as we transition from the late Precambrian into the Cambrian, we see there's an increase in global temperature. And so the oceans begin to become warmer. So this is obviously a positive for life. At the same time, we also have an increase in the amount of continental shelf space. So the continental shelf is the seafloor that sits just off the coast of the continents in water depths with a range between zero and 200 meters. Now, this is the area of the ocean where life really likes to be. It's the most productive part of the ocean basin. And so as we transition from the Precambrian into the Cambrian, we have a lot of continents breaking up. And this breaking up of continents leads to the formation of a lot of coastlines. And of course, these coastlines have lots and lots of continental shelf around them. So there's lots of these environments where animals really, really want to live. And so there's lots of space, lots of room for them to begin to colonize. And so that's also going to help and encourage evolution to really start producing animals in large numbers. The final thing that we begin to see as we transition into the Cambrian is we begin to see a distinct split between the herbivores and the carnivores. So in the case of the Idiocarium fauna, which formed at the end of the Precambrian, there's actually a bit of a question about whether the Idiocarium fauna are technically plants or whether they're animals. Now, we've re had some recent research that actually shows that at least one member of the Idiocarium fauna was definitely an animal. However, by the time we make it into the Cambrian, we begin to see you know, nice, clear distinctions between animals and plants. And we also begin to see distinctions forming between predators and prey. So we begin to see uh, between uh, we begin to see uh, animals which are uh, being actively hunted. We begin to see them developing larger and more complex defense mechanisms such as shells. And so that's going to help encourage shell formation. But we also see the steady adaptation of predators during the Cambrian explosion. So uh, one particular predator called Anomalocaris uh, is absolutely, you know, truly spectacular. It's a very interesting animal. And um, that was the apex predator for the early Cambrian. And we can see steadily over time Anomalocaris becoming more and more adapted as the animals it was eating uh, developed better and better defenses. And so the arms race, also helps to encourage the formation of shells. Because predators have begun to appear, shells become more and more important. And so evolution kicks in and the shells become more and more, uh, become thicker, bigger, and also have better defenses. So we begin to see the appearance of things like spines. So there's, you know, there's a few reasons why the transition from the Precambrian to Cambrian is the perfect time for life to begin evolving. And also it's the perfect time for life to begin evolving shells in you know, large numbers. So when we look at life in the Paleozoic, we're going to split it into three broad groups, the early Paleozoic, the middle Paleozoic and the late Paleozoic. So crudely, when we're talking about the early Paleozoic, we're typically referring to the Cambrian or Ordovician, Middle Paleozoic, Silurian and Devonian, and Late Paleozoic, Carboniferous and Permian.
So in the early Paleozoic, life is limited to the ocean basin. So all the uh, life that we can see is going to be within the oceans. And so we see a quite a broad range of animals. We begin to see uh, we begin to see the trilobites making their appearance. We see uh, a range of uh, cephalopods beginning to appear. We have a range of filter feeding organisms appearing. So organisms such as the archaeocythids and then the rugos corals begin to make their appearance. We see the appearance of the crinoids and we see the appearance of very early fish also beginning to make their appearance in the early Paleozoic. Now, fish are very, very important to the evolution of the vertebrates. So that's essentially the group of animals that has spinal columns, which includes humans. So fish essentially are at the base of that family line. And so the first group of fish which have a, a very crude spinal column is a group of fish which are referred to as the chordates. And they make their appearance during the early Paleozoic. And so as we progress throughout the Paleozoic, we see fish evolving to become more and more complex. So as we move into the middle Paleozoic, what do we see? Well, trilobites are still uh, moving around on the seafloor. We still have the rugos corals, but we also begin to see uh, the appearance of other filter feeding organisms. So we see the appearance of organisms which we today would classify as corals, but we also see another group of organisms called the bryozoans becoming more common. In terms of the water itself, we begin to see more and more fish beginning to make their appearance. So we see fish steadily evolving from the very, very simple chordates, and we see the evolution of groups of fish that have bony or at least leathery skin. This is a group of fish that which we refer to as the ostracoderms. And so these armored fish uh, steadily evolve as we progress through the Paleozoic, and eventually we see the evolution of the cartilaginous fish. This is the group of fish that's eventually going to give rise to the sharks and the rays. And then eventually we have the development of a couple of groups of fish which we refer to as the ray-finned fish and the lobe-finned fish. So the ray-finned fish are very important. They account for about 99% of all modern fish. However, it's the, uh, it's the lobe-finned fish which are actually more important for the evolution of mammals. And we're going to come on to that in a second. So in terms of life on the continents, uh, we begin to see plant life moving from the oceans onto the land during the late Ordovician and into the early Silurian. And it would seem based on some of the uh, computer models which have been run that around the same time, this uh, early or late Ordovician to early Silurian period, it would also seem that some of the arthropods began to leave the ocean environment and move onto the land. And of course, this group would eventually give rise to groups of animals like the insects. So in terms of um, in terms of the fish, the uh, lobe finned fish are very, very important because lobe finned fish, as the name suggests, have big, powerful lobe shaped fins. Now that might not sound that interesting. However, compare that to a normal fish. So think of a fish like a salmon, for instance, or a trout. If you've ever looked at the fins of them, what you'll notice is the fins are supported by very, very thin bones, which are called rays. And so that explains the name ray finned fish. Now, the problem is, is that these fins are on the whole relatively weak. They're not strong at all. In contrast, lobe finned fish have fins which consist of big sturdy bones. They're really, really robust features. Now, these lobe finned fish are therefore going to be the most likely line to give rise to the amphibians. And there's one particular group of lobe finned fish called the Celiacanthomorpha, which uh, seem to develop adaptations which uh, resemble very early amphibians. And so what seems to happen is the Celiacanthomorpha begin to develop more and more overdeveloped limbs, both hind limbs and forelimbs, and they steadily begin to change their body shape, their head becomes broader and flatter, the eyes move towards the top of the head, they develop nostrils on the ends of their nose, and eventually we steadily see the Celiacanthomorpha evolving to give rise to the amphibians in the Devonian, 
Now, as we move into the late Paleozoic, that's the Carboniferous and the Permian, we see a lot of stuff is happening in both the oceans and on the land. So in terms of the oceans itself, the general makeup of the oceans isn't changing too much. We're steadily seeing the fish becoming more and more evolved, and we're seeing uh, ray finned fish moving from a skeleton that's mostly cartilage to a skeleton that's mostly made of bone. Now, in terms of on the land, that's where the really interesting stuff is taking place. So throughout the Silurian and into the Devonian, we steadily see the development of two types of large plants. One group is called the seedless vascular plants and one group is called the gymnosperms. And by the time we're into the late Paleozoic and the Carboniferous especially, we see that conditions are absolutely perfect for the formation of extensive forests. And so during the Carboniferous, we see the, uh, the formation of large areas of the Earth's surface, which are covered in these, uh, in these gymnosperms and in these seedless vascular plants, some of which reach extremely large sizes. We're talking tens of meters in height, so tree, tree kind of size. Now, to be clear, these aren't the kinds of trees which we're probably thinking of. So I say tree to you, you probably think oak tree. Well, an oak tree is actually a group of organisms which are referred to as the angiosperms. It's a flowering organism, and they aren't going to make their appearance until the Mesozoic. So in terms of the late Paleozoic, we have these seedless vascular plants and we have these gymnosperms. And in modern environments, the most common type of gymnosperm that you would probably know are conifer trees. And so gymnosperms account for around 10% of modern day uh, plant life. However, in the late Paleozoic, they would have made up a very substantial portion of the plant life on the surface of the earth. So we have lots of gymnosperms, lots of seedless vascular plants, lots of ferns. So in terms of life on the continents during the Paleozoic, things are really getting super interesting. So as we transition from the middle to late Paleozoic, of course, we have the Celiacanthomorpha evolving into the amphibians. And as we move into the Carboniferous, we see the amphibians beginning to evolve into the reptiles. Now, by the end of the Carboniferous and going into the early Permian, we see the evolution of a very interesting group of reptilian animals called the Plicosaurs. And there's actually a couple of them here in this picture. They're sometimes referred to as the fin-backed reptiles because they have these rather distinctive fins on their back there. Now, the interesting thing about some of these plicosaurs is that they begin to have traits which we would actually associate with mammals. And so one uh, organism in particular called Dimetrodon um, has a couple of adaptations which are very mammal-like when compared to other reptiles. So the first thing we begin to see with uh, Dimetrodon is that it has two distinct types of teeth. Now, this is a really big change because before this point, predators would just have one style of tooth. Herbivores would just have one style of tooth. There was no differentiation between the teeth. However, Dimetrodon has distinctly different teeth. So in the front of its mouth, it has uh, incisor-like teeth and canine-like teeth for grabbing the prey and killing it. And then behind it, it has a bank of teeth which are more designed for tearing the meat off the bone kind of kind of similar and kind of similar to canines and molars almost for the processing of the meat before swallowing it and so uh, dimetrodon has these two distinct types of teeth and as i'm sure you probably know man one of the uh, key distinguishing features of something being a mammal is that it has differentiated teeth it has incisors canines and molars and so the fact that Dimetrodon is starting to show these traits with regards to teeth suggests that it is a distant relative of the mammals. We can also see in terms of the position of the legs of Dimetrodon, they didn't stick out of the side. So if you think of a, a reptile, think of a crocodile, for instance, think about how it moves. The legs stick out of the side and it moves by dragging its belly across the ground. In the case of Dimetrodon, it actually looks like the legs were positioned more underneath the body, and this allowed the uh, Dimetrodon to actually keep its belly and tail off the ground. Now, this is actually super helpful because it's number one, it's very energy efficient because it's no longer having to drag its belly along the ground, wasting energy to do that. 
but it also means therefore that they can be faster so they can move more quickly so they're more efficient predators and so this means that the plicosaurs and dimetrodon especially become very very successful and so what we see as we move into the uh, the permian is we begin to see a branch of plicosaurs beginning to evolve into a group of organisms which are called the therapsids and it's the therapsids which are super important to mammals because the therapsids are very often described as mammal-like reptiles they're really starting to develop a lot of traits which we would consider mammalian now on the whole they're still more reptile than mammal but they have lots of traits which we would consider mammalian and then obviously as we move in later and later into the paleozoic we see the thrapsids becoming more and more mammal like so what about life in the mesozoic well in the triassic the general climate was pretty hot and pretty dry it was a continuation of the type of climate that we tended to see in the permian now i should have mentioned that at the end of the permian of course we have the permo trias mass extinction and that does a lot of damage to life in the oceans but it also does a lot of damage to life on land so for instance we see these very very large forests of um of gymnosperms and seedless vascular plants dying back and we see the loss of groups of animals which were very very important in the late paleozoic so for instance the amphibians get hit very very hard by the permo trias mass extinction and we see the large amphibian species that have been building up during the late paleozoic getting completely wiped out and from that point out that point on amphibians tend to be rather small animals now, as I said, conditions uh, during the Triassic were on the whole relatively hot and relatively dry. And so this is obviously going to favour reptiles because they like those kinds of conditions. It's not going to be particularly favourable for the development of large amounts of vegetation because hot and dry conditions, you know, aren't particularly great for, you know, the, the growth of plants. And so what we see in the Triassic is we see a lot, you know, lots of desert environments and we tend to have wooded environments associated with the coastlines and the margins of lakes. Now, in terms of the dinosaurs, they don't actually start to make their appearance until the late Triassic. So before that, we have a, a range of precursor uh, reptiles that eventually give rise to the dinosaurs. They're referred to as the archaeosaurs, and they are present from the, uh, the early to middle Triassic, and we steadily see them becoming more and more evolved. We begin to see the first uh, group of organisms, organisms which we would consider dinosaurs appearing in the very, very late Triassic. Now, as we progress from the Triassic to the Jurassic, we see a general change in global conditions. The uh, global climate becomes a lot more humid and it becomes a lot wetter. So amounts of rainfall begin to increase. And so, of course, this leads, unsurprisingly, to an increase in the amount of vegetation. So we start seeing the development of uh, large forested areas, which are absolutely stuffed with ferns and uh, gymnosperms. So, you know, tree like trees which are similar to conifers and so because we have all this vegetation of course these are the perfect conditions for large herbivores to begin to develop and so we see the appearance of the large herbivorous dinosaurs so organisms like the sauropods that have the long necks and other groups of organisms like the stegosauria which of course have rows of plates along their back and a, a tail which has a load of spines now, during the Mesozoic, we also begin to see the evolution of the birds. Uh, so the birds are going to form from the uh, theropod line of dinosaurs. So the theropods are a group of meat-eating dinosaurs that move around on two legs. So we can see one right here. This is a dinosaur called Allosaurus. So we know that the birds began to develop from small theropods that, you know, not Allosaurus, way too big, but we're talking very small theropods. And these theropods seem to have initially developed feathers. We don't actually know why they developed feathers. It could have been for heat control. It could have been for display purposes. It could have been maybe for camouflage. We don't really know. 
But over time, what we can see is that these organisms that develop feathers steadily begin to become adapted for gliding, and then they seem to steadily become adapted for powered flight, so using their wings to actually power themselves through the air. And we see this transition taking place during the Jurassic. So by the time we're moving towards the end of the Jurassic, we have a group of bird-like reptiles, essentially. Now, also during the Middle Jurassic, we begin to see the mammals beginning to become more and more established. Now, to be clear, the Mesozoic is ruled by the dinosaurs, so mammals are a relatively minor proportion of life on the continents, and on the whole, they're relatively small. So think of animals the size of mice and rats, mostly. And that's because they have to be small, because they're trying to constantly escape and not be eaten by dinosaurs. So, you know, being small is quite helpful, because it means you can squeeze into small spaces and hide yourself. Now, as we progress into the Cretaceous, things get a little bit more interesting. So the supercontinent of Pangaea that's been steadily breaking up throughout the Jurassic and the, and the Jurassic is now completely broken up by the time we make it into the Cretaceous. And so this means we have continents moving all over the surface of the Earth, and each of these continents begins to take on its own distinct environment. And so obviously, because each continent has its own distinct environment, that's eventually going to lead to the appearance of rather distinctive flora and fauna, which is adapted to those particular conditions. So as we move into the Cretaceous, we begin to see changes in the types of dinosaurs which are present. So to begin with, we see the sauropods, the long neck dinosaurs, begin to decrease in their abundance. They're becoming less and less common. And instead, what we begin to see is we begin to see them being replaced by a group of dinosaurs called the ornithopods. These are often uh, referred, well, they, they contain a group of dinosaurs that's often referred to as the duck bill dinosaurs. And so it would seem that the sauropods begin to become outcompeted by the ornithopods and the sauropods begin to die down. And this would also seem to be um, a reflection of the fact that these large forested areas which were present in the Jurassic seem to die back a bit during the Cretaceous. And so this means large amounts of food become more difficult to get hold of. And so very, very large herbivores like the sauropods begin to find themselves at an evolutionary disadvantage. Now I should point out this doesn't actually happen everywhere. In the case of South America, we actually see that the sauropods begin to do amazingly well during the Cretaceous. And so this would suggest that in South America during the Cretaceous, conditions were still good for the existence of large areas of forest. And so these would have provided the perfect food source for sauropods. And so during the Cretaceous in South America, we actually see the sauropods becoming larger and larger. And they actually end up forming a group of supersized dinosaurs, which are called the Titanosauriforms. And these are the, the truly huge dinosaurs, the absolutely massive ones. At the same time, as the sauropods in South America become larger, it means the animals that hunt them must also become larger if they want to be able to kill them. And so we see a, a range of theropod dinosaurs in South America, which also begin to become larger and larger in response to their need to essentially be able to kill larger and larger sauropods. Now, in terms of um, in terms of the mammals, the mammals are still a relatively small amount of the the general population of animals, and they're still relatively small. Not really much to speak of. Now, by the time we're in the Cretaceous, we also see a change in the plant life. So we see the appearance of angiosperms, and the angiosperms establish themselves very, very quickly. So angiosperms are flowering plants, and they establish themselves very, very fast, and they begin to take over from the other plants which were dominant, the seedless vascular plants and the gymnosperms. And as we're moving through the Cretaceous, we begin to see the gymnosperms and the seedless vascular plants being pushed back as the... As the um, as the angiosperms become more and more dominant.
Now, by the time we're moving towards the end of the Cretaceous, we essentially see dinosaurs reaching what you could define as their evolutionary peak. You have you know, a whole range of uh, different herbivores. You have a diverse group of herbivores, each with their own distinctive style. So, for instance, here we have a group of ceratopsian dinosaurs that have the frills along the back of their head to protect their neck. Of course, the most common type of ceratopsian dinosaurs would be something like a triceratops. We then also have a group of dinosaurs back here, uh, like the Pachyocephalosaurs. This is a group of dinosaurs that have big, strong, bony skulls, and they would run headfirst into each other like modern-day rams, probably to compete for mates and to compete for dominance over the herd. But we also see the evolution of the theropod dinosaurs. So by the time we're in the Cretaceous, we see the large theropod dinosaurs, like Tyrannosaurus rex, evolving. And we also see the development of a lot of very, very uh, well, smaller, but more lightly built, but faster and more intelligent uh, theropods. So this would be organisms such as Velociraptors and Utahraptors. Now, this animal, this group is particularly interesting because we believe that a lot of these raptors, these smaller, faster meat eaters, had feathers. And so that would once again suggest that they are related, at least distantly, to birds. Now, at the end of the Mesozoic, of course, we have the Cretaceous tertiary mass extinction, which kills off a large amount of organisms uh, on the Earth, but it also does a lot of damage to plant life, and of course, it also does a lot of damage to the oceans. So, on land, obviously, we see the dinosaurs uh, disappearing. We also see the, uh, the gymnosperms, which tend to form uh, larger trees during this time period, also being uh, pushed back and... and um, and made extinct, uh, or at least a lot of the species become extinct. Now, in terms of the Cenozoic in the oceans, we see the loss of uh, some very common organisms from the Mesozoic. So we see the ammonites disappearing, and we see uh, filter feeding organisms such as the Rudis disappearing. Now, as we move into the Cenozoic, the conditions are actually relatively similar to the Cretaceous. On the whole, conditions are relatively warm and relatively wet. So these are still perfect conditions for plant life. And so what we see as we move into the Cenozoic is we see the angiosperms moving very, very quickly to reestablish themselves, and they diversify very, very fast. And this rapid diversification of the angiosperms very quickly makes them the dominant type of plant. And that's carried all the way through to the present day. So in the modern environment, angiosperms account for about 90% of all plant life. The other 10% is about is you know, made up of about 9% gymnosperms and about 1% seedless vascular plants. Th this is simply because the gymnosperms have been steadily pushed back and the only place they exist now in large quantities is in the conifer forests of uh, Canada and Russia in, and Scandinavia in particular, these high um, latitude environments which tend to be quite cold. So they're not really suited for uh, angiosperms in large quantities. So instead the gymnosperms become very specially adapted to those cold conditions. Now, in terms of the early Cenozoic, as I was saying, conditions were a lot like the Cretaceous, very warm, relatively wet. So uh, plant life recovered relatively quickly. And initially, we actually see the birds becoming the most uh, dominant group. And this leads to the evolution of a, a group of large flightless birds, which are referred to as the terror birds. So think of a, a bird that's kind of a cross between a dodo and a velociraptor from Jurassic Park. And you kind of get the idea of what a terror bird was. It would have been quite a, an imposing predatory bird. Now, obviously being so large, it didn't have the capacity to fly. It would have used its legs to run along a bit like an ostrich. Now, obviously, as well in the Cenozoic, we see the mammals beginning to steadily uh, become more and more important because the dinosaurs are gone now. This means there's a lot of environmental niches which are up for grabs. Now, initially, the birds are winning, but over time, the mammals steadily begin to overtake them. And so the other thing that's of great importance during the Cenozoic is the appearance of grass. Now, as we progress through the Cenozoic, we begin to see temperatures getting steadily cooler. And what this means is because the temperatures start getting cooler, we begin to see these large areas of forest dying back and they get replaced by grassland. So this appearance of grass means that all of a sudden you have a food source that animals are going to try and exploit 
And so what you end up with is you end up with a lot of herbivores that become specialized for eating grass because it's just so numerous, it's everywhere. Grass is a very, very successful plant. And so we have a shift essentially from uh, animals that are designed for eating leaves from trees and bushes to animals which instead decide to graze grasslands. And this is a reflection of the general shift in the global climate. Now, as we progress throughout the Cenozoic, we see the mammals diversifying even further and becoming the dominant group of organisms. And as we come towards the end of the Cenozoic, we obviously went into the most recent ice age. And this led to the uh, evolution of groups of animals which were suited to the cold conditions. Of course, the classic example would be the woolly mammoth. Obviously, once the Ice Age ended, these specialised animals steadily became extinct, and over time we've begun to see uh, evolution moving the uh, species towards what we would consider to be their modern styles, their modern looks. Alright, thank you for watching everybody, and have a good day.